you know we're a little smaller crowd today perhaps because it's summertime father's day folks are away you know when when the congregation size is a little smaller like this i'm always inspired to pray god give us double the blessing today so he's done that already i think in our worship and i hope he continues to do that even now as we worship over the word uh, Hans Kung, uh, the now late and sometimes rebellious Roman Catholic theologian, published a book in 1984 entitled On Being a Christian. In it, he described the Christian life. The problem with his book was that it didn't include a chapter on prayer. When asked uh, about this oversight, uh, he explained that, in fact, um, it, was a, it was a serious problem. <laughs> um, he, he explained that when he was actually writing the book, he was so harassed by the Vatican and so busy trying to meet his publisher's deadline that he forgot to include a chapter on prayer. That feels like a very apt metaphor for our prayer lives, the forgotten chapter. <laughs> Developing a, a meaningful prayer life is one of the greatest challenges of the Christian life. Certainly a, a part of the problem is the, the hurried pace of modern life. We, we feel press to keep moving to the next thing that, that needs to be done. Another challenge is simply that prayer is one of the hardest spiritual disciplines to practice. Private prayer is being in an isolated place, talking to someone that you can't see and who doesn't audibly answer. In a sense, it's almost easier to give witness for Christ to a hostile audience than it is to pray. But I think actually the problem runs deeper than that. Our greatest need is that we don't feel our need for prayer. When we're in the midst of a crisis, prayer happens much more readily. Um, I'll share something with you that's happening in the life of Jonathan Pennington, and I've mentioned his name. He's uh, a writer, commentator, teacher, um, much of Brad and I's work has been guided by him on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. He's also a personal friend. Um, about, I think actually June 6, his wife Tracy, who's also named Tracy, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, she had surgery this last Wednesday, uh, and at best, at very best, there is a long road to recovery, and it may not get better. That's really the scary thing. Uh, please be in prayer for them. But I, I just I share that with you because we all know the experience that it's not hard to pray a lot when someone you love has a brain tumor. If there was a, a daily repeating diagnosis of a brain tumor in our family or friends, we would probably pray a lot every day. So feeling our need is an important dynamic in, in maintaining our prayer lives. Another struggle is that we, we just feel often that we don't know how to pray. There are some really goofy ideas about how to pray. Jesus actually deals with one of those in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. He said, when, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrase, phrases as the Gentiles do, because they think that they're, they'll be heard for their many words. Um, a few months ago, we were in, uh, we were flying, Mike, Karen and I were flying to Pittsburgh on Southwest Airlines. And, you know, by now, uh, Karen and I are pretty seasoned travelers. And I confess that I totally uh, tune out the stewardess 
when she's talking to us about how to buckle our seat belts and where the exits are. I know where the exits are. Uh, so I was, I was settled in there and I was reading my Kindle, uh, just absorbed by what I was reading. And then I suddenly became aware that the stewardess was saying, and I quote, blah, 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 blah. And none of you are listening anyway. <laughs> You know, the single word in verse 7, which is translated, heap up empty phrases. It takes four English words to express the idea of that one singular word. The word actually is baralageseta. Now say that three times real fast. Baralageseta, baralageseta, blah, 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 blah. It's actually one of those words that sounds like what it means. Um, this is the need, this need for knowing how to pray that prompted the disciples to ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Our struggle to know what to pray is why Jesus included a pattern for praying in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I want to address this. I've never heard any complaints about us doing the Lord's Prayer in our our services. Uh, Some would object. We We do it many times. Some would object to praying the Lord's Prayer in a worship service. Um, What about that? Is that okay to do that? Is that, you know, heaping phrases? Um, is, it, is it wrong just to keep repeating that? If, if we're saying the words mindlessly, obviously that is a vain repetition. But what if we say it from the heart? Is that okay? You know, it's, it's helpful to compare Matthew's gospel account with Luke's gospel account as we answer that question. Here in Matthew, I'll invite you to open to Matthew chapter 6. We'll read it in just a moment. In Matthew chapter 6, as Jesus introduces the Lord's Prayer, he says, pray like this. And that command actually emphasizes that the, the Lord's Prayer is a, it's a guiding pattern. It's a pattern that we can use in our prayers. But in Luke's presentation of the Lord's Prayer, which was probably on a different occasion, Jesus actually says, Say this when you pray. That command emphasizes that this prayer is actually something to be repeated. The Lord's Prayer is something to be repeated. So at the end of the day, both saying this prayer as it is, together corporately or even privately, and using this prayer as a petition um, for, for prayer, a pattern for prayer, Both of those actually are prescribed by Jesus, that we should do those things. Today I'm preaching from Matthew, and and the big idea of my message is pray like this. We'll be looking at the prayer to understand the petitions, and from them actually to expand uh, into prayer in other areas of our lives from the Lord's Prayer. There is a sense... There is a sense in which everything we pray is in some way related to one of the requests in the Lord's Prayer. If we would pray as Jesus taught us, we do need to learn to to pray like this. So, um, I I want to just observe something about the, the place of the Lord's Prayer in the life of the church. Um, Jonathan Pennington makes the point, so I'm quoting him again this morning, that the Lord's Prayer is in the center of the center of the center of the Sermon on the Mount. And you know what? I didn't really get what he was saying before I read that about three or four times. Um, But this is what he meant. The Lord's Prayer is... In the is well, let me back up a little bit. Just re, a little bit of Sermon on the Mount review. Remember that 
There are three parts. There's just about three of everything in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. There are three parts. The Beatitudes, and then that larger section of where he talks about greater righteousness. And then there's a, these concluding metaphors in the Sermon on, on the Mount. The Lord's Prayer is in the center of that middle section of greater righteousness. So it's sandwiched right in between the six sayings of the Old Testament and the three key relationships with money and daily needs and judging people. That, that's that's, that's this, actually the second center. It's right in, in the middle of those. It's also in the center of the, the middle section um, that where there are three practices of righteousness. So there's, there's giving to the poor. And then on the other side of the Lord's Prayer, there's, there's fasting. So the Lord's Prayer is right in the middle, right in the center of the center. Now, I'll let you draw your own conclusions about whether or not Matthew intended to, get from, uh, to give to us the idea that the Lord's Prayer is really important. The early church saw the, saw the importance of the Lord's Prayer uh, for church life as well as personal discipleship. Um, there's a book that we actually have called the Didache, and uh, that word means teaching in, in Greek. And it's actually the oldest manual of Christian living that exists. It was probably written within 50 years of the completion of the, the, New, the New Testament. And in the Didache, it included instructions about the Lord's Prayer that were, that were immediately after instructions to baptismal candidates and the, the manner and practice of, of baptism. You know, if baptism is important, and it is, then that would also stress they saw the importance of the Lord's Prayer in the life of the church and in the life of, of disciples. It's important. Let's talk a little bit about just the place of the Lord's Prayer also in our personal relationship with God. Jesus begins this model prayer with the words, Our Father in heaven. In all the recorded prayers of the, the book of Psalms, 100, 150 of them, there's not one occasion in which the psalmist addresses God and says, Our Father. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus moves us into a, a half step closer in our intimacy with God. The, the shift to understanding God as our Heavenly Father came with the incarnation of the Son of God. That explains, in fact, also why the New Testament writers retain that Aramaic addressed to God that was on the lips of Jesus, and we also see on the lips of the Apostle Paul in his letter. Jesus prayed, here it is, Abba, Father. Did, did you ever wonder why that sounds a little bit strange to us? It's, it's, it, it is an Aramaic word that's, that children use to address their father. That's how intimate and personal that word is. Uh, for you dads today, I don't know what you've chosen for your children to call you. Um, but for, for all of you as fathers, happy Father's Day. And you, you deserve that honor that I, that I hope that they give you today. Um, when we pray our Father in heaven, we're, we're, we're being called and reminded not only that God is intimate with us, but also that he's above us. He is our Father in heaven. Uh, we're reminded that God is personal, and yet he's also transcendent. He is in heaven. He is God. And we are not. So we have intimacy, 
But we also need to remember when we pray who we're talking to. This address to God also draws attention to our life together. Jesus taught us to pray our Father in heaven. Prayer isn't just about me and God. Prayer is about God and us. In the Lord's Prayer, there are actually no singular pronouns. There's no I, no me. It's all us and our. That, that brings me to pause here for an, an application. The place of the Lord's Prayer, the place of the Lord's Prayer in, church his, in the Bible, in church history, reminds us that really indicates to us that we shouldn't resist praying the Lord's Prayer. It's a part of our discipleship to pray it and learn it um, and learn it and, and indeed how to align our prayer life with what is important by what Jesus taught us. Um, you know, it was reported that the American patriot um, Nathan Hale said before his execution, uh, executed by the British for spying, it was said that he, that he said that he regretted that he only had one life to give for his country. You've probably heard that before. I regret that I only have one sermon to preach on the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Um, Our treatment of these petitions is going to have to be brief, but every petition is important to help us to to pray. So I want to do something right now. We're going to just stop right at this point. We're going to read this passage, but I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, as I read, just in respect for God and his word, um, reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You know what? Let's say it together. Let me go back and start at our Father. Let's say it with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, You know, the Didache actually includes those final words in the teaching to believers. Hear these last two words. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. There are six petitions in the Lord's Prayer. Like every other part of the Sermon on the Mount, This prayer is very tightly structured. And the structure actually helps us to to learn the first principle of prayer. Uh, The prayer is divided into two parts, with each part having three petitions. Uh, The first three petitions are focused on God's glory, specifically God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. The second three petitions are focused on our needs, specifically our daily bread, our moral debt, and our temptations. 
I think that there's a, a principle, to, another principle, to take away from this. Our daily prayer lives should be concerned with God's interests as well as our needs. Um, the prayer is evenly divided between them, and there's no need for you to keep close track on your prayers and make sure you keep them perfectly balanced. That would be legalism. But our prayers should include the cause of God in them. In the Lord's Prayer, God's concerns, um, His concerns actually come first. That's because God is the most important person in the universe. Let me say that again. God is the most important person in the universe. This also means that when we devote ourselves to our prayer closet time, you know what I mean by that, where we get alone. I think actually Jesus even talked about an inner room for praying, not in, not in, in Matthew, but he does other places in the Gospels. When we, when we have our, our, our prayer closet time, we shouldn't just barge in to the presence of God. Um, God is a great king. And as we approach him, we need to approach him with a sense of awe and respect to him. And that's a great reason to begin, first of all, praying about his concerns, his interests. In, in our call to worship uh, prayer, our leaders are doing this every Sunday. They did it, this morning, we, we did it again as we prepared to worship God. Um, that good model needs to be practiced in our prayer closets. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about that prayer time when you're going down the road and you just remembered something and you send up a little telegraph prayer to God. I'm not talking about that time. I'm talking about time when you're actually kind of finding a private place where you can pour your heart out to God about something. It's good to pour your heart out to God, but good to begin first with God's concerns and, and his greatness. Um, your prayer closet um, is whatever private place that you have found to uh, devote yourself to prayer. Now, my prayer closet is about 20 acres north of Polo at what's called the cemetery. <laughs> So I'm using that word very metaphorically. It's just wherever you find a private place where you can pray. Uh, Jesus himself often went into the wilderness or on a mountain or even at the end in a garden to find a private place to call upon his heavenly Father. So um, let's affirm that prayer is about our needs, and we have lots of them, don't we? Needs drive us to pray, and that's a good thing. All we need to do is be like children who want something <laughs> and ask our Heavenly Father for it. That's what He wants us. In that, in that way, He wants to be, for, for us to be like children. Um, but that's a good thing. But let us also... Uh, in fact, let us remember that nothing is off limits in prayer. But as we approach God, let us also remember that He is God and we are not. Let's examine the first three petition uh, for God's glory a bit closer. The, the first petition is, hallowed be your name. Um, I think we, we all know that a person's name represents who they are. When we pray for God's name to be hallowed, we're praying that God may be honored. That's what that name, word hallowed means, simply to be honored. Uh, so it's, we're not talking about just hot hallowing the title or the name, but the person who stands behind that name. So, so praying for the hallowing of God's name is, is more than a concern about using God as a swear word. 
It's praying that more people, including yourself, might recognize and treat the God of the Bible as the special and important person that he is. It's also a prayer that that more people would come to know God. When we say, may your your name be hallowed, we're we're praying for other people, that they'll do that, that they'll do that. So in a sense, when we pray, hallowed be your name, um, even the, the, the next two petitions as well, we're praying not only in worship, we're praying evangelistically that God would work in the lives of others. The second petition is your kingdom come. And we see in this petition that the kingdom is not just something that Jesus came to announce, but it's also something for us to long for and desire. God is sovereign in manifesting His kingdom. He determines the times and the the extent to which His kingdom is manifested in the world. But, and this is important, He has ordained that our prayers are engaged in extending His kingdom. God works in response to our praying. Longing for the kingdom is hoping for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we can see that uh, there's overlap even, especially in these first three petitions. There's a lot of overlap between them. Um, In addition, longing for the, the kingdom is yearning for wrongs to be put right. This is a prayer for justice in human relationships. When we pray for your kingdom to come, we're praying for justice to be established on the earth. It's also about putting our own personal lives, uh, being put right with personal righteousness. The kingdom has arrived with the coming of Jesus Christ. But one of the mysteries of the kingdom is that it's in our midst and it's growing slowly until that time when Jesus shall return to bring the kingdom in its fullness. So we participate in the kingdom right now. You and I are doing that. Even here today, we're participating in the kingdom, and we long for the fullness of the kingdom that is not yet, and that fuels our prayers. This petition reminds us that the world is occupied by opposing forces, And our king has made it his purpose to take back the territory that he has lost. He's going to do that by extending his kingdom, not by physical warfare, not by human governments, but by spiritual power that overcomes the powers and authorities of this present darkness and frees people to worship him. This prayer, thy kingdom come, is a a request we pray when we're in spiritual conflict. This prayer is, it's a part of putting on the armor of God. Folks, when we see and read about the slaughter of, of children and teachers in our public school systems. And we hear about and read about the senseless killing in the neighborhoods of Chicago by gang violence. And as we hear about the destruction of the lives of infants in abortion, Let us transpose our anger and indignation and grief into prayers for God's kingdom to come and put this world right. The third petition is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven 
recognizes that right now there is a disconnect between heaven and earth. God is Lord of all, and yet his rule is being defied on planet earth. Jesus' mission is bringing God's rule to earth in a fuller way. Folks, he's still doing that. That's what he came announcing, and he is still doing that through his people. Bringing God's rule to earth. As we would say in Zambia, pangono, pangono, bit by bit, little by little. And it's being expressed in your life and through your life to others who are living out the wisdom of the greater righteousness that Jesus taught us about. Our longing and God's longing, this is the longing of God also, is that everything that is best about heaven would also be true of earth. Let me say that again. God's longing and our longing is that the best that is true of heaven would also be true of earth. That God himself would be worshipped and adored and known by all. That's the vision that is being described throughout the Bible, but just think especially of the book of Revelation, those last two or three chapters, where the the heavenly Jerusalem is coming down to earth, and the glory of God fills the earth. That's really what we're praying for when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we'll pray this prayer, And in fact, if we'll pray all of those requests for God's glory, if we'll pray that in sincerity and earnestness, then also, here's an application. We must be prepared to act in a way that fulfills what we are praying for. If we want God's name to be treated with honor and respect, then we should treat his name with honor and respect. Um, if we want for God's kingdom to his kingdom rule to come upon the earth, then we must be prepared to obey his commandments. If we want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we must be careful and earnest to walk in his will, not perfectly, but substantially and growing in it. Let's shift now to the, the second set of, of, the three, of three petitions that focus on our needs. The first petition focusing on our needs is give us this day our daily bread. The word bread is a word that often stands in the Bible for all food. It, it's a little bit like saying, let's go get a Coke. And that doesn't mean that you're going to actually buy a Coca-Cola, but you're going to have you're going to have soda water. You're going to have pop. Um, The word bread, actually here in the Lord's Prayer, I think should be understood as kind of a blanket word that covers all of our physical needs. It's never wrong to pray for our physical needs. Our Lord Jesus forever buried the idea that the physical is inferior to the spiritual or invisible. When when he took upon himself human flesh and became dependent upon daily bread, Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, because he himself prayed that prayer. This is his prayer also. Every time that we see Jesus eating a meal, he sanctifies that food with a a prayer of thanksgiving (coughs) and blessing. Folks, the physical is good. And physical needs are a legitimate focus of our praying. Just a bit later in Jesus' sermon, he instructs us about why we shouldn't be anxious for the daily things of the daily needs of life, food and, and drink. 
Um, and we shouldn't do that because we shouldn't be anxious because our Heavenly Father knows we need them and He will provide them. You know, one of the realities of life that Karen and I learn more deeply, and I'm sure that many of you could repeat this story in, in, in various different ways, but we learned it more intently, more deeply while living in Zambia among and working among the poor. Um, we learned that they are far more conscious of their dependence upon God to provide their daily bread. I, I don't know if it was in this context before, but I'll, I'll never forget, maybe you've heard me say this before, uh, when one of the pastors that I, was in the program, after I had brought some food from our garden and shared it with the pastors, uh, he said, he was giving thanks publicly, and he said, Pastor, he said, addressing me, he said, Pastor, I hope that you understand that oftentimes we go to bed hungry at night. Brothers and sisters, don't take for granted God's provision for your daily needs. He has richly blessed us. But day by day, he wants us to ask him to provide and to thank him for his provision. So do that. And just as an added application, also do your part in feeding those who don't have daily bread. You be the hands of God that provides for them their needs, whether it's giving or whether it's personally, you be the hands of God. The second petition of our needs is, is forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. What comes to light in Jesus' words in this petition is that sin is a moral debt that must be paid. You know, as Westerners, we don't think quite so much of sins being a debt. Part of the reason for this is the, the difference in cultural perspectives in biblical culture, and in fact, many cultures around the world, um, in many cultures around the world, honor and shame figure much larger in human relationships. An offense against someone is often viewed in, in the sense of dishonoring that person, and it leaves a debt to be paid. Um, let me draw again on our experience in Zambia. I remember when one of our teammates um, forgot about a dinner engagement with some Zambian friends. And they heard through the grapevine afterwards, they didn't even remember it at all that evening. But afterwards, they heard through the grapevine that the, the friends that they had not shown up for dinner at their place were highly offended. Um, that they had not shown up, that they hadn't come. When our American friends asked some Zambian friends, other Zambian friends, what they should do to repair the relationship, they were counseled that they should go to the marketplace, buy a chicken, and take the chicken live to the family that they had disrespected, dishonored. Uh, there was a debt to be paid, and the custom, and I suspect that this is true across in many different African cultures. The custom for repairing a, a relationship that's been offended is take them a live chicken. <laughs> so they did that. And, and their offended host were overwhelmed with joy <laughs> that they showed up. These Americans showed up at our doorstep with a chicken and they were welcomed in with, with joy. Let's, let's translate this idea into our relationship with God in the Lord's Prayer. It's not a one-on-one -on -one correspondence. But forgiveness, forgiveness for us from God, would be the canceling of the debt that's created by our sin. We owe God a death for our transgression. On the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. We owe God a death. 
we have violated his holiness and his justice. And that requires that a, a, the debt must be paid. This is why Jesus died on the cross. He is the Lamb of God who was sacrificed for our sins. When we put our faith in Jesus, God forgives the debt of our sins because Jesus has paid the penalty price. This is the, the price of redemption. When God forgives, redemption doesn't mean that we, weren't, we were not guilty. It means that our guilt has been forgiven because the price has been paid. There's an important sense in which God has forgiven our entire debt from the moment that we put our faith in Christ. There's a sense in which that is true. But there's also another sense in which forgiveness must be renewed in our daily experience because we sin daily. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray this prayer. This forgiveness is conditioned upon a continuing attitude of faith that confesses and asks for forgiveness. There is another condition that we find here that's surprising. We are forgiven as we also have forgiven our debtors. If there's any question about what Jesus means here, we only have to look at verse 14 and 15. This is so important that Jesus actually expanded the meaning of this prayer, this prayer petition. He says in verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their, tres their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Folks, this is not an isolated teaching. We find it elsewhere in Matthew and the New Testament. And here's the short version of how I understand this teaching. I hope this is helpful to you. Maybe you have even other insights that could be added. First of all, let's just recognize that it is, it can be very hard to forgive. Because our desire for justice is strong. And we have been sinned against by others. And some of you could stand and tell testimonies and stories of, of, of being trespassed by another that are simply horrific, beyond my imagination. So it's hard because we do have a sense of justice that things ought to be put right. The second thing, the second thing I want to say is that saving faith Saving faith, when we have faith in Jesus, it's not just intellectually assenting that we are forgiven. Saving faith is actually tasting forgiveness in such a way as to be empowered to forgive others. That's, this is part of the Spirit's work in our lives in the new birth. Third, the power to forgive others is energized. Folks, it's energized by being satisfied with the sufficiency of God's forgiveness in our lives right now. To forgive others their sins takes the very same faith that it, that it takes for you to believe that God has forgiven you. The very same faith. Not a different kind of faith. The very same faith. If you don't have the experience of being forgiven, then sooner or later in life, you will probably be confronted with a situation in which you will not have the power to forgive. Pastor Kent Hughes tells a, a story of an unforgiving spirit that was recorded actually by Robert Louis Stevenson. There were two married sisters who shared a single room. Um, they're, they're Scots. Um, and uh, they shared this room, and, but they had a falling out over some point of doctrine 
in the Christian faith. And the controversy was so bitter that they never spoke to one another ever again. Never. It's not unheard of, is it? Maybe you've even experienced that. Somebody cuts you off. For whatever reasons, probably financial mostly, they continued sharing the same single room together for the rest of their lives. They drew a chalk line on the floor that divided the room so that they both had access to the doorway and the fireplace so that they could go in and out and do their cooking without stepping into the territory of the other sister. So for years, they coexisted in hateful silence. Their meals and presents were endured in complete silence. Their family visitors were exposed to the unfriendly silence as they they came in and greeted them. At night, they went to bed listening to the breathing of the enemy in the bed across the room. Because they were both good Scottish Presbyterians, they went to church week by week, and guess what they did? They recited the Lord's Prayer. Because that's what you do when you're a Scottish Presbyterian. But not with sincerity and truth. Brothers and sisters, don't excuse yourself from the searching truth of this petition. Don't convince yourself that your offense, your case, is different. If there is someone that you have not forgiven, you need to seek the grace of forgiveness. The third petition and last concerning our needs is for God to deliver us from evil in, in Matthew 6.13 and lead us not into temptation, but <clears throat> deliver us from evil. We should think about this I think as a single petition with with two parts. First, there there is a prayer that God wouldn't tempt us. This is is a puzzling prayer because we, we know that the Apostle James says that God never tempts anyone. In other words, God... God doesn't try to provoke us to sin. That would make him evil if he did that. Part of the problem is that the the Greek word for temptation is exactly the same word translated testing or to test. And so it's only by context that you determine actually whether it should be translated testing or temptation. We know that Jesus was tempted by the devil. In fact, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to endure that time of temptation by the devil. But the Spirit wasn't trying to, to, trying to get Jesus to sin. God tests His people to refine them and to discipline them, but always for their good. He does not tempt people, meaning that He does not seek our downfall through trials. That's the work of the evil one who tempted Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. We can summarize that, that God never tempts us in the, in, the, in the sense of enticing us to sin, but he does test us. Secondly, this prayer also acknowledges our sinfulness, and the need for God's power and wisdom to deliver us from evil. Several translations give this verse a a different reading, and they're probably are are more accurate. They read here, instead of deliver us from evil, they read deliver us from the evil one. Part of the reason we need to pray the Lord's Prayer is that it it tutors us in how to do spiritual warfare with the great enemy of our souls. How are we going to defeat him? Folks, he's wiser than we are. He's more powerful than we are. How are we going to defeat him? Part of the way God is going to do that is when his people are praying in the words and the spirit 
of the Lord's Prayer. You know, one of the things that Paul says, or I'm sorry, the Apostle John says, is the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Do you believe that? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Part of that is happening now. There's a big day when that's going to happen. But part of that is happening now, even as we pray like this. I hope you take up praying the Lord's Prayer, if you don't already. Um, it's a good thing. There are some times when we just don't have the words to say. Sometimes when the words just won't come. Sometimes we're so rolled over, overwhelmed by what we're facing, that the Lord's Prayer is the only thing I can get out of my mouth. I hope you'll make that true in your life, but more than that, a pattern for developing in the whole of your, your prayer life. I'll ask you to stand now for the benediction.